Yes. Hello. Um, thank you, all of you, for very interesting talks. Um, as a psychologist who is strongly committed to interdisciplinary work and struggles most of the time to uh, get different disciplines to not only work with each other but understand different languages, I wonder if you would comment about how do you, what have been the biggest difficulties in engaging the behavioral and social sciences in this work? So um, you can hear me, right? Um, so uh, the biggest problem we've had, this has mainly been in this big data grant that I'm part of. It's uh, about 60% uh, uh, computer scientist, engineer, um, oh no, 75%, mainly computer science engineer, a uh, couple of behavioral scientists and some statisticians. And the problem we confront all the time is that we're using the exact same words to mean totally different things. So that's an issue that we have to always spend some time uh, defining the words that we use or the phrases that we use. We also have um, very different cultural norms. I bet you have seen something similar. Um, so the way in which we communicate or the, um, if whether we com communicate with a more supportive voice or that also, we have very different ways. You know, as a statistician, when I talk to my computer scientist friends, we'll just say, you're wrong. <laughs> and uh, this is completely inappropriate in a um, behavioral science or a medical science uh, setting. Yeah, I, I, could, I couldn't agree more. <laughs> Vocabulary is a big issue. Um, We've worked not only in the examples I gave, but, but also with health, where I found co commun communication between computer scientists and physicians could be quite difficult on uh, vocabulary, style of communication, of course, also. Um, another issue that I would see is, um, so when we work with people from comparative literature, uh, being able to understand what is interesting to work on from the computer science point of view needs, needs to be able to understand that from the literature side, and from the literature side, being able to understand uh, what may be feasible. And if, I, if I can just jump in and make a little plug, we face this problem in Madison too, and we recently received a really nice uh, grant from the National Science Foundation it's a, called an a, a interdisciplinary research training grant. And this involves computer scientists, mainly computer scientists, psychologists, and educational science people. Uh, and uh, our model is to co-train new groups of graduate students who will work together. And one way that we're trying to accomplish this is we're actually teaming up students from the social sciences with mm -hmm. the computer sciences in pairs. So one computer science graduate student paired up with a social science graduate student, and they'll work together for a year on a project. And we're hoping that this, one of those things is we're going to actually build a little table of vocabulary translations and so yeah. forth, but also we're trying to build uh, new, uh, uh, you know, we're going to let them be the liaisons yeah. between the, the various areas. So I think yeah. that, I'm hoping it'll help a lot. Yes, another question. Yes, this question is for Kathy. Uh, so Kathy, uh, in, in, sorry, Susan, uh, Susan, in your talk, uh, in your talk, uh -huh. uh, in working towards developing these mobile apps, you know, you were concerned about the number of subjects you have, number of data points you have and all that. You know, what are the risks and rewards of maybe relying on domain knowledge to pre-populate maybe some of the policies for your reinforcement learning agents, things like that. I mean, are there risks in taking that kind of an approach? Abs what, what are your thoughts? This is a fantastic question. And uh, our whole agenda is uh, we, in fact, we actually say that we anchor our reinforcement learnings off of the experts' uh, decision rules, the experts' way of matching the treatment to the context. So we always anchor off that, but we attempt to enrich it. Um, I think domain knowledge is absolutely critical. 
I, I would, it'll be interesting to hear from the other speakers, but in the field of mobile health, there's, the signal is low, the noise is high, and in that setting, domain knowledge is absolutely critical, and you, I think you need to anchor off of what other people understand and various different types of analyses as well. Yeah, I mean, we definitely use, uh, look to how knowledge about the particular task or the domain can help us more. So our work in disaster where we're exploiting features uh, with, with knowledge about disaster. So that, that uh, would definitely be um, part of what we do. But I, I would echo Rob um, that it is important to put people together side by side to work together. And, I think an institute is the, is the perfect way to make that happen. We'll take the next question from the left. This question is for Rob Novak. Thanks mm -hmm. for your wonderful talk, all three of you. Um, when you brought up the robot bartender, um, it reminded me this is actually not that different from message tailoring for physicians. I'm a faculty member in learning health sciences. And so one challenge we face in medicine is that when you tell a doctor what to do, if uh, it's not really clear what the logic was behind that decision, mm -hmm. the advice is not likely to be uh, followed or really even appreciated. So in the robot bartender, you have some logic behind the scenes as to how it's actually deciding, you know, uh, beer A or beer, beer B, C or D. Uh, do you communicate that, uh, you know, this is what we think you like uh, to the actual user, uh, you know, to get kind of an idea of how we could do some of these machine learning approaches uh, and give that message back to clinicians? Yeah, that's a, a great point. I mean, I think, you know, a couple of th things about systems like that beer mapper. One, you know, people aren't going to use it if it, the recommendations that are coming out aren't pretty good right off the bat, right? You don't want to have something that takes a ton of training before it starts doing anything <coughs> useful for a user. But then in terms of giving the user some insight into what is behind those recommendations or those suggestions or whatever they are, I mean, that's a, a tough question. The way we've sort of addressed it with the beer mapper is to give the user a very visual display of where they are in this space and then look at, you can, it'll drop pins down. Here are the beers that you've rated highly and you can see where they are. You can explore around, find other uh, beers that you might not have known about that are in, in the vicinity of those. So I guess one good way would be to provide something that's very easy for a user to uh, digest, which is a visual representation of some of the uh, information that's being combined along with feedback that they're giving to that system. And in Beer Mapper, it's in the form of this map that you can actually, uh, you know, visually inspect. So, but I guess probably for any given problem, you'd have to customize that to what, what, what's needed by the user. For, so for doctors and so forth, I'm not sure. We, I'd have to think a little bit about what would make sense there. But yeah, definitely giving the user some indication of what's going on behind the scenes is critical for them to accept and adopt these tools. And were your three axes principal components or were they something else? Uh, no, they're actually uh, something else. If you go to the demo outside, we've actually reduced it to just a two-dimensional map, but you can change the layering of that map. And so these features that are extracted automatically from the ratebeer.com database roughly correspond. The principal ones are almost like principal components. They have to do with the color, lightness or darkness, and then the bitterness or maltiness of the beer are a couple of the principal axes that are discovered automatically. But it's not exactly, uh, uh, it's more of a, a nonlinear kind of embedding as opposed to a principal component approach. We'll take a question from the stage left. Yeah, sure. Thank you, everyone, for your talks. They were all great. Um, I think one complaint or um, criticism of uh, an initiative like this or data science as a discipline is that uh, we do need people in the domain and then we also need statisticians or mathematicians and each of them separately should go deep into their field. Um, so how do you see, uh, you know, this institute actually bringing people together that can somehow go deep in both areas or do you have examples that you could share with us where actually bringing things together allowed us to go deep and perhaps in a new field? Um, I, th I think it's often the case that when um, a problem comes to you from um, another field or domain that it's hard. And um, 
it challenges, so I'm, I'm speaking more from on the technology side, it, it challenges you to really um, go deep and, and novel in terms of the kind of technology that you have to develop to address it. And um, I think working with somebody uh, from the domain also really keeps you honest in terms of what is interesting uh, or valid for, for the output. Uh, I'd like to speak to that. That's been a big problem in one of the grants that I'm involved with, one of the collaborative research groups, in that um, often the problems that the behavioral scientists bring are not sufficiently um, algorithmic or challenging for the data scientists. And so um, what we've tried to do is have really open discussions about what constitutes science in each of the fields uh, and, and how we can collaborate and have novelty and innovation on both sides. Um, you had touched a little bit on this earlier, Kathleen. But I think having these open conversations is, is critical so that both sides understand. It's just not like running a machine learning algorithm is enough for a PhD thesis. You know, that's just, and, and everybody understanding where both sides, and managing expectations, which you also uh, commented on, is really important. It's not like that we can solve everything right away. No. And maybe I'll just say a little bit. Um, you know, my own personal experience is I, I go to a lot of talks on campus. I love hearing about other people's science and research. And often they do have data science problems, challenges that they face. And to be honest, in many cases, uh, there are simple things that you should try first, right? And that's what I'll recommend to them. But I'd say, you know, uh, more, in a lot of cases, I'll go to these talks, they'll have a data science challenge and I don't know what to do. I don't have a great algorithm to just say, hey, go run this. And that's when I get excited and that's when I go deep. That's when I start saying, wow, this is a new data science challenge that we don't have good tools for. So I think it kind of happens automatically as long as you have an institute that brings together people from different disciplines and then you know, both sides have to be listening to each other. Um, just to give you another personal example, I'm looking a little bit at uh, the New Yorker cartoon caption contest with Bob Mankoff, who's the editor of the New Yorker. And here's the deal. They get about 5,000 caption entries every week for their cartoons. And the question is, and this is the, the question they have, is how can we uh, use crowdsourcing or other means to help us figure out which captions might really be the funniest. And it might sound easy. You might say, well, let's just crowdsource this thing. But if you think about how many captions we're talking about uh, and really the available pool of any crowd, whether you use Amazon, Mechanical Turk, or something else, it's a bit daunting. And so we're trying to think mathematically, how, how can you use human annotators to sort through very vast volumes of data quickly and efficiently. And, and so again, there's an example of a challenge that just comes up. I don't know what the right way to do it or the best way to do it is. And that's making me think deeply about how to, how to solve problems like this. Yeah, uh, we have one minute left. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm afraid we're only going to be able to accommodate one more question. And uh, I think we'll take it from stage right since uh, stage right has been waiting longer. Uh, so so I'm, I'm happy that you, you've sort of started to touch on, on the question I was going to ask, but I, I'm, I'm hoping to hear more of a concrete solution. So one of the, the challenges that we often encounter um, is when, when we're working as, as, a, as a scientist on a problem where there's a, a solution that's been developed in machine learning or in data science, um, it's adequately avant-garde that it's sophisticated enough that there's not really an off-the-shelf solution that, that we can implement but it's sometimes also not so exciting that it's going to be a dissertation project. And so one of the questions is, is who, who are the stewards or the owners from, from the methodological side who can assist the scientists when, when the innovation isn't adequately scientifically exciting, but it's still adequately complex that a scientist can't really self-implement? We, we actually, well, I think uh, we actually use undergraduates often for these types of settings. We they, do too, yeah. Y'all do too, yeah. yeah, and it works out great. Yeah. I mean, you have to find really good undergrads, but they're yeah, out you there. To, you, you, uh, and yeah. sometimes it turns out your problem's more complicated than you think it is, like Rob had mentioned earlier. But having younger people get involved in these kinds of problems makes a, 
I, that's the way I yeah. usually go. Yeah, depending on the, the amount of funding available, if you can have a um, paid programmer, for example, that, that can be quite good as well. Okay, well good. Well, thank, thank all the panelists for their responses and thank the questioners too. They are interested in devel developing a platform that can easily allow you to fuse data, aggregate data, and clean data from multiple sources.